okay, me.
Okay. Um, Tom Lantos, Human Rights Commission, uh, officially begins here. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's uh, Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission hearing on organized crime, gangs, and human rights in Latin America. I extend a special welcome to uh, Mr. Harris um, and uh, from Maryland, uh, and um, and I uh, and uh, and our panelists, who I will introduce shortly. We have a large panel today. We expect votes to be called relatively soon, uh, probably around 10, 15 or so. Uh, so I'm going to try to be brief, but anyone paying attention to Latin America knows that the region is confronting many challenges. These include high rates of violence and homicide, often linked to organized crime. To cite one indicator, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime has found that the Americas have the highest homicide rate in the world, and organized crime is responsible for at least half of all homicides. In 2021, eight of the 10 countries with the highest murder rates were in Latin America and the Caribbean. Overall, figures like these, like, like these mask important differences among countries in the dynamics of crime and violence and in government responses. The three countries we are focusing on today, Mexico, El Salvador, and Colombia, have distinct histories and experiences. What they have in common, though, is that all are confronting entrenched criminal organizations whose territorial control and operations put many people at risk, normal people just trying to live their lives, and the civil society leaders, journalists, and politicians who try to stand up to them. In El Salvador, it's criminal gangs who have been engaged in drugs, extortion, money laundering, and weapons smuggling since the 1990s. In Mexico, it's drug cartels that have evolved into transnational criminal organizations. In Colombia, it was initially armed groups with political agendas financed by criminal activity, including the illicit drug trade. Since the 2016 peace agreement removed the FARC from the picture, the remaining insurgent groups have persisted and evolved, and new criminal organizations have appeared. Some may wonder why we are drawing attention to organized crime and gangs as a human rights problem, since they are private actors. And there are several reasons. First, under international uh, uh, human rights law, states have an obligation to protect individual security. Article 3 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whose 75th anniversary we commemorate this week, says that, and I quote, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person, end quote. This is echoed in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the American Convention on Human Rights. But many states seem clearly to be failing to meet their obligation to protect, and that may give rise to state responsib responsibility by omission. Second, there are well-substantiated allegations that government officials, including the military and police, have been complicit in the activities of gangs and organized criminal groups in the three countries we're discussing today. We should not be surprised. The role corruption plays in empowering bad actors is clear, but it is another reason that governments are responsible. Third, organized crime is a human rights problem because too often the policies governments implement to combat it end up undermining people's rights. And El Salvador is a case in point. Under the state of emergency imposed in March 2022, more than 72,000 people have been arbitrarily detained. Hundreds of abuses have been uh, documented, including torture, denial of food, medicine, and access to legal counsel, and deaths in custody. The Commission held a hearing last September on the grave consequences of the state of exception for human rights. Even when citizen security policies are not designed to be highly repressive, they can have negative consequences for human rights. Mexico's hugs not bullets policy is supposed to prioritize the socioeconomic drivers of violent crime. But the government has deepened the military's role in public security, underfunded investigations, and the justice system and spied on, the, and spied on and attacked human rights defenders, including one of the witnesses in this commission's June 2022 hearing on Mexico. In Colombia, the government's total peace policy raises complex questions about the legal status of criminal organizations and whether their victims can access transitional justice processes. Meanwhile, high popular expectations that are that the petrol government would improve security in rural areas have not been met. In particular, social and community leaders continue to be killed at a pace only slightly lower than prior years. So, 
Given that gangs and organized crime are a human rights problem, we should focus on human rights-based approaches to confronting it. And that's our objective today, and I look forward to, to hearing from our, our, our witnesses and getting your recommendations. Uh, do, you, do you want, want to, do you have, Mr. Harris? Okay, all right, so I'm going to go right to the witnesses. Where's my, um, here we go. Uh, so, our witnesses include Stephanie Brewer, uh, is the director for Mexico at the Washington Office for Latin America, WOLA. Adam Isaacson is the director for defense oversight at WOLA. Uh, Juanita uh, Goy Bertus Estrada is the director of the Americas Division at Human Rights Watch. Uh, Tamara um, Tarachiuk Tar 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 uh, Broner uh, is director of the Peter D. Bell Rule of Law Program at the Inter-American Dialogue. Uh, uh, Renata um, Demi Chelis Avila uh, is the office director for Mexico at Elemental Human Rights. Sergio de la Pena is the former deputy assistant secretary of defense for Western Hemisphere Affairs. Um, and and um, and I'm just giving the titles and and we'll meet, and we're going to put into the record your extensive biographies, but um, it will take me a long time to read all of your resumes. So I think we'd rather get to the testimony. And again, I apologize for uh, mispronouncing people's names, but please correct the record when you, when you speak. So we will begin with uh, it's Stephanie. It's Stephanie. We will begin with you. Good morning. Um, Stephanie Brewer, Director from Mexico with WOLA, the Washington Office on Latin America. Thank you for convening this important hearing. Mexico is a paradigmatic example of how policies that purport to respond to organized crime by violating human rights generate devastating consequences for victims and their families while failing to build security and the rule of law. When state agents operate by violating rights, the result is an institutional environment where authorities learn to routinely falsify information, hide their activities, and operate outside the law all ingredients that foster corruption, further abuses, and lack of progress in reducing crime. Today, it's necessary to analyze Mexico's anti-crime policies, not only from a human rights perspective, but in light of their broader effects on civil and military relations and on Mexico's democratic institutions, especially the judicial branch. Mexico's principal response to organized crime has been military deployment. This approach increased sharply with US support during the presidency of Felipe Calderón, beginning in, in 2006 uh, to 2012, in the framework of a war on crime that led to a dramatic increase in rights violations. Over the following decade and a half, annual homicides more than tripled, disappearances skyrocketed, and criminal groups fragmented and reconfigured, and Mexico's population has suffered the consequences. Military human rights violations have since fallen from the truly extreme numbers seen during the Calderón administration, but continue to occur. Current President Andres Manuel López Obrador has deepened the military model, placing the, the civilian federal police with a militarized National Guard. The armed forces have seen dramatic budget increases despite their lack of transparency. And uh, as mentioned, this occurs even as the military spies on human rights defenders, hides information regarding serious rights violations, and fails to comply with legal obligations, such as registering its arrests in the National Detention Registry. Moreover, militarization as a model fails to address Mexico's low rates of effective criminal investigations. Mexico cannot militarily deploy its way out of that problem. Violence occurs due to this climate of impunity and to collusion between state and non-state actors. State agents may work directly with organized crime, as in the context of the notorious enforced disappearance of the 43 Ayotzinapa students, in which security forces at different levels, both civilian and military, were found to be in collusion with criminal groups. At best, authorities may turn a blind eye to such groups' activities. A second tendency seen in Mexico are legal actions and discourse that seek to weaken the autonomy of the judicial branch. In 2019, Mexico increased the list of crimes under which defendants are placed in mandatory pretrial detention. That is, judges are stripped of their authority to decide who goes to prison while awaiting trial. This generates a perverse incentive for authorities to focus on increasing the number of people physically going to prison without necessarily having to build solid cases against them, and this in a country where arbitrary detentions and trials have long been endemic. In addition, López Obrador and members of his cabinet 
routinely tell the population that judges who rule against prosecutors are thereby generating impunity. In fact, the vast majority of impunity in Mexico occurs prior to cases ever coming before a judge. This, attack of, this climate of attacks on judicial autonomy only lowers the bar for criminal investigations and weakens judges' ability to protect human rights. A human rights-based response to crime must recognize that the state will be effective at combating crime by private actors to the extent that state agents themselves obey the law. It is vital that Mexico build capable, trustworthy, and sufficiently resourced civilian security and justice institutions. It is urgent to improve federal investigations, given that organized crime falls under federal jurisdiction. Investigators should prioritize patterns of violence that most affect the population, making use of intelligence, technology, and mapping of networks to construct evidence-based cases that can go to court, with a focus on dismantling criminal phenomena, not just arresting people in flagrante or prosecuting crimes like weapons possession one by one. Reducing availability of firearms, which flow largely from the United States, is crucial. Another key intervention point to weaken organized crime is reducing recruitment, as recent studies have highlighted. We recommend that U.S. cooperation focus on improving the work of civilian institutions and accountability for corrupt and rights-violating agents. Recent and ongoing areas of cooperation that should be prioritized include improving the operation of the criminal justice system, anti-corruption efforts, implementation of Mexico's laws against torture and disappearances, and forensic capacity. A human rights approach to cooperation also means raising concerns with relevant authorities and publicly about rights violations and the need for accountability for perpetrators. It's also essential to maintain human rights reporting requirements in security assistance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Adam Isaacson. Thank you, Chairman McGovern, uh, Congressman Harris, uh, for, for calling this hearing, for being here. It's an honor to be here with you today. I'm going to talk about Colombia, which today has a uh, confusing array of armed and criminal groups. There's the Gulf Clan, there's the FARC, there's ex-FARC dissidents, I should say, there's the ELN, and there's many, many smaller regional ones. They run the drug trade. They degrade the environment. They facilitate migration, including through the Darien Gap. They kill thousands of people each year including the world's highest numbers of murdered human rights and environmental defenders. They displace or confine hundreds of thousands each year. In 2016, Colombia's largest leftist guerrilla group, the FARC, signed a peace accord and demobilized. Guerrillas have disappeared from many areas. They're not around, they're not in the roads around Bogota anymore. They're not in the slums around Medellin anymore. But it's hard to find a place in Colombia that was under organized crimes influence 30 years ago that isn't under that same influence today. You know, the top leaders may have been jailed or extradited, that the group's names change, but organized crime is still active. Often, the groups can trace their DNA back to the cartels and paramilitaries of a generation ago. Why? Why is that? Why is organized crime so much harder to fight than the FARC was? My written testimony lists a few reasons, but most importantly, the FARC actually wanted to fight the government. Organized crime really prefers not to do that. Fighting the government is bad for business. Instead, organized crime thrives on its relationship with government. Corruption is the oxygen it breathes. My written testimony includes 10 alleged examples since 2022 of Colombian military and police who've colluded with organized crime. Criminals need police who will look the other way when a cocaine shipment is going downriver. They need mayors who go along when they traffic people or dig illegal gold mines out in the open. They need prosecutors who let cases die. This is a hard problem, but it's solvable. It's possible to protect people and institutions and to cut organized crime out of the picture permanently. The answer isn't send the military or declare a state of emergency and then just keep renewing it. In a phrase, the winning long-term strategy is government presence with low impunity. What does that mean? It means bringing the government into areas where there is none. And Colombia has a lot of those areas. There's rural towns and urban neighborhoods where people go years without seeing anybody from their government. Sometimes they can't even obtain the local currency, but they do see lots of armed actors. That's not enough on its own, though, because government, government can be corrupted. Just adding more of them could make things worse. State presence has to come with a justice system who can guarantee consequences for collusion. Prosecutors, judges, and investigators need personnel, protection, technology. It's important, too, to have strong, watchful social organizations and media. Now, Colombia does have many, many brave officials and social leaders who are trying to build this low impunity state presence and challenge organized crime. We need always to be asking, is the United States government firmly on those reformers' side, or does that support get squishy uh, because of other interests like trade, drugs, migration, China? So 
I pointed to a long-term solution, but it, you know, it takes years to build state presence with a justice system. How can governments make people feel safer in the short term? How can they buy time? In Latin America, we've seen two kinds of short-term responses to organized crime, the mano dura or the iron fist or negotiations. In El Salvador, Nayib Bukele is using the mano dura with gangs right now, but in, at be, the beginning of his term, he tried negotiations. In Colombia, Gustavo Petro is negotiating. He calls the strategy total peace. Basically, it's offering talks and for criminal groups, offering lighter punishments if they surrender and make amends to their victims. Just like Mano Dura, this raises human rights flags. Negotiations could end up giving light sentences to people who committed serious human rights abuses and have lots of victims. Some of these people already demobilized after earlier negotiations and then they reneged on it. To justify taking a step like that, President Petro would need to show a dramatic improvement in security in the short term. So far, we're not seeing that. As, as Congressman McGovern mentioned, kidnappings are up, homicides are at last year's levels despite two ceasefires, killings of human rights defenders and social leaders are down only slightly. If total peace can work, though, it would make Colombians feel safer in the short term without, without Monodura's militarization and human rights abuse. It could buy time for a long-term government presence without impunity strategy to take root. If people feel safer, they'll be patient. But is there a long-term strategy? I'm, I'm not seeing it yet. I am seeing um, good intentions, goodwill. Uh, this year, the Petro government published new rights-based security and drug policies, but those are documents. In the first 16 months, the Petro government has lacked the managerial capacity to make them reality. Budgets are too low. Agency heads are inexperienced. Coordination is poor. Lines of command are unclear. And too often, officials are learning about policies or, or personnel changes from the president's Twitter account. Polls show frustration with this improvisation and stagnation. It's not too late to fix this in Colombia. If it can get its managerial house in order, the Petro government could complement or, or could, yeah, could, could implement its short-term plan, total peace, and complement it with the longer-term low impunity governance plan promised by its new security and drug policy strategies and also promised really by the 2016 peace accord. Then Colombia could see historic progress because organized crime would have fewer vacuums to fill and fewer allies embedded in government. The Petro government isn't organized yet, though. The trajectory is uncertain. For now, Colombia's armed and criminal groups are not on the defensive yet. Civil society still is. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Juanita Goibertus Estrada. Thank you so much, and good morning to everyone. I'm honored to appear uh, before the Tom Nantos Human Rights Commission. Organized crime and gangs have a dramatic impact on human rights in Latin America and the Caribbean. As Congressman McGovern it was citing, the United Nations Office on Drug and Crime reports that approximately 50% of homicides in the region are linked to organized crime and gangs. But maybe most importantly, it also reports that while in Europe, for example, there are eight persons convicted for every 10 intentional homicide victims, in the region, fewer than two are convicted that suggests chronic impunity in the Americas compared to other regions. I will focus particularly on the situation in El Salvador, but I'm happy to take questions on Colombia and Mexico as well. Gangs, including the MS-13 and Barrio 18, have for decades tormented communities in El Salvador, using brutal violence, including killings and rape, to extort people and gain control over the territory. The response by past governments typically oscillated between two failed strategies obscure negotiation with gangs and iron fist security policies that led to rights violations and new cycles of violence. President Najib Bukele has combined both measures. As the Department of Justice has shown, his government carried out behind the scene negotiation with gangs, offering MS-13 gang leaders prison and judicial benefits, including protection from extradition to the US in exchange for decreasing the homicide rate and even electoral support. But after a wave of murders in March 2022, the government announced a war against gangs and the Legislative Assembly, controlled by President Bukele, declared a state of emergency, suspending several constitutional rights. 21 months later, the state of emergency remains in force. Since it was first established, police and soldiers have arrested more than 73,000 people, roughly 1.6% of the country's population. This includes by now 2,800 children and adolescents. The Legislative Assembly has also approved a series of measures proposed by President Bukele to address gang violence that allow judges to imprison children as young as 12 and dangerously expand the use of pretrial detention and counterterrorism legislation. 
More recently, in July, it passed a law that, according to the Minister of Justice and lawmakers, would allow courts to try up to 900 people jointly without presenting individual evidence against each of them. At Human Rights Watch, we have documented widespread human rights violations committed during the state of emergency, including arbitrary arrests and forced disappearances, torture and other ill treatment of detainees, including more than 170 that have died in jail, as well as mass due process violations. Hundreds of people detained have no apparent connection to gangs' uh, abusive activity. We continue also to document similar cases, uh, particularly focusing on children and adolescents. Homicides, which have been decreasing since 2015, have fallen even further, with official figures indicating a rate of 7.8 homicides per 100,000 people in 2022 and even lower in 2023. Although changes in the ways killings are counted and reports of manipulations make it very hard to estimate the true extent of the reduction, the number of killings and extortion in the country, once among the highest in the world, has sharply diminished. However, there are serious reasons to question the sustainability of President Bukele's security measures. El Salvador lacks the forensic and judicial capacity to successfully investigate criminal networks, adjudicate the cases concerning such number of detainees, ensure justice for victims, guarantee due process, and sustainably control prisons. In fact, to date, out of the 73,000 that have been in prison, no adult detained during the state of emergency appears to have been sentenced. And even worse, um, the seizures of weapons have decreased in the country. Worryingly, governments across the region, including in Ecuador, Honduras, Peru, have also declared state of emergencies to respond to violence and crime, and many officials and candidates have replicated President Bukele's public messaging, even if they have not carried out similar policies on the ground. Much on the contrary, sustainably addressing organized crime and gang violence in Latin America and the Caribbean demands bolstering forensic and judicial capacity to conduct strategic criminal prosecutions, focusing on severing the networks of finance, political support, corruption, as Adam Isaacson was mentioning, weapons supply that allow criminal organizations to operate. It also requires addressing the root causes of criminality, including youth unemployment and high levels of inequality and social exclusion. Latin America and the Caribbean is not only the region with the highest homicide rate in the world, it is also the region where more homicides go unpunished. Strengthening the judicial system to effectively investigate these crimes will be key to protecting the rights threatened by organized crimes and gangs. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Tamara, Tar Tamara Tarachuk uh, Broner. Did I pronounce Thank that right? Did I, did I pronounce that correctly? That was perfect. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Congressman, and good morning, everyone. It's a honor to participate in this year. Uh, Latin America and the Caribbean face enormous challenges to the rule of law with weak state institutions, poor governance structures, limited transparency, authoritarian leaders, and high levels of insecurity and crime. The inability of democratic leaders to deliver on people's needs creates a breeding ground for leaders from across the ideological spectrum to justify authoritarian policies under the guise of effectiveness, eroding democratic guarantees. Changing this narrative of the savior leader bypassing the rule of law to solve people's problems is very hard. It is essential to find policies that are both effective and democratic, and to address insecurity, a balanced approach is needed between punitive measures with due process and social preventive measures addressing the root causes of violence. Weak judicial insecurity, unpredictable commercial laws and regulations also hinder the business environment in many countries, negatively impacting private investment from both local and foreign sources and hampering economic development. Corruption undermines the public trust in government, it fuels income inequality, poverty, violence, and it facilitates insidious links between the government, business, and organized crime. The underground economy from illegal activities such as drug trafficking, human trafficking, smuggling, and money laundering can undermine legitimate businesses and erode trust in public institutions and law enforcement. And this diminished confidence in the authority's ability to maintain order and to prosecute criminal activities creates a very challenging environment for businesses. Organized, group, organized crime groups may infiltrate legal systems, it leads to compromised judicial processes and impunity, and it hinders the ability of businesses to seek legal recourse. This erosion of trust is worse when governments undermine judicial independence, like in the case of Mexico and El Salvador. 
businesses face extortion, violence, intimidation by criminal actors, which affects their ability to operate both ethically and sustainably. And they also need to invest significantly in security measures to protect their assets and personnel. This includes hiring security personnel, implementing surveillance systems, fortifying facilities, all of which increases operational costs. Moreover, the reach of criminal organizations extends well beyond national borders. They take advantage of jurisdictional gaps and differences in legal systems. So no single nation can effectively combat them alone. Transnational criminal organizations often rely on sophisticated money laundering networks and exploit the global financial system to legitimize and conceal the alleged origins of their funds. The elections coming up in El Salvador and Mexico occur in a context in which the current administrations have attempted to consolidate executive power at the expense of the Organized crimes involvement in electoral financing continues to compromise the integrity of democratic processes, introducing corruption and illicit influence into the political sphere. Criminal organizations can influence political outcomes by bribing political actors, bribing government officials, and they may exploit loopholes in campaign financing regulations to inject illicit funds into political campaigns. Of course, limited transparency and independent enforcement mechanisms fuel these concerns. To address these challenges, a coordinated regional response against transnational crime is needed. Traditional law enforcement methods are not enough, and this emphasizes the need for cooperation among countries to gather intelligence, to share information, and to conduct joint operations to apprehend criminals and dismantle these networks. It is also key to strengthen regulations for monitoring private electoral financing by implementing clear rules and oversight mechanisms to track and disclose private political contributions, establishing effective whistleblower protection laws, and cooperating to facilitate extradition and prosecution for those responsible for corrupting the electorate process. It is also critical, as it was mentioned before, to strengthen the rule of law, judicial independence, and effective prosecutions by reviewing and updating legislation to ensure that it is comprehensive and effective against various forms of organized crime, enhancing transparency both in legal processes and in administrative actions, and establishing accountability and oversight mechanisms to address corruption within the legal system. It is also key to implement secure and transparent processes for judicial appointments and removals to ensure that judges are pro and independent. And finally, to curb democratic decline in the region, it is essential to involve a range of actors concerned with weak rule of law, including the business sector. And to engage the private sector, it is critical to speak their language. It's not necessarily about promoting democracy or rights, which some but not all business leaders in the region are concerned about, but rather a conversation about how to ensure legal certainty and clear, predictable rules of the game that promote investment and operations. And this is essential because strengthening democratic rules of the game for illicit activity undermines the ability of illicit ones to expand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um... Renata Demichilis Avila. Good morning, everyone. My name is Renata Demichilis Avila. I'm director for Mexico in Elementa Human Rights, a nonprofit organization based in Mexico and Colombia. I thank the commission for the opportunity given to speak here today on this pressing matter. I'll be addressing the challenges and obstacles to fulfilling victims' rights with a special focus on impacts of US trials of organized crime figures on truth and justice in our countries. For more than six decades, the war on drugs had various impacts on people's rights, specifically in Latin American countries where drugs are produced and trafficked. The illicit drug market has generated networks of macrocriminality and corruption that are sustained by different sources of violence that have led to serious human rights violations. Massacres, torture, sexual violence, and forced dis displacement, recruitment, and disappearances, arbitrary detentions, among other horrific crimes, are consequences of the extreme violence inflicted by both state and non-state actors. These have become exponential in recent years due to the kingpin strategy that has fragmented the criminal groups, leading to more frequent and more serious disputes and expressions of violence. As a crisis deepens and impunity prevails, victims' rights to, truth, to truth and justice have seemed to be fading away. We have identified three main reasons that hinder processes of truth, justice, and reparation in our countries. First, the weakness of our criminal justice system. 
Second, in the specific case of Mexico, the significant degree of collusion between state actors and organized crime, which fuels impunity and prevents the implementation of effective transnational justice processes. Third, the prioritization by the governments for prosecuting drug offenses over human rights violations and other crimes committed by state and non-state actors to maintain the illicit drug market. On the last matter, a specific mention needs to be made regarding extradition. In the pursuit of criminal networks, extradition plays a key role in the U.S. bilateral relations with Latin American countries such as Mexico and Colombia. In the case of Mexico, for example, to increase cooperation on extraditions is a main goal under the Bicentennial Framework. There is no doubt that under current conditions of impunity and weakened justice systems, extraditions might be the strongest path to hold responsible criminal actors, state and non-state, for their actions. But what actions? U.S. indictments are commonly focused only on drug-related crimes such as trafficking and money laundering, leaving aside horrific crimes such as a previously mentioned, committed on the way to grow their territorial control and operations. Although we've seen accusations mention how the accused participate in mass killings and disappearances, for example, but only to frame the seriousness of drug-related crimes committed. In spite of following internal processes, we've seen our countries grant extraditions almost immediately, automatically, with no analysis on what it means for achieving truth and local justice demands. In Colombia, there have been multiple efforts from victims to claim their right to be taken into consideration on extradition decisions, with no positive res results whatsoever. Elementa has been monitoring U.S. trials and pre-trials to find that on many occasions, the information revealed during criminal procedures hinder the local processes of tr truth and justice to victims. For example, sealed information conditions access to the truth about macro-criminality networks regarding drug trafficking. Although it is important to have some secrecy in criminal procedures to safeguard the ongoing investigations, specifically for Mexico, the already mentioned Ajotzinapa case brings light on this matter. We have seen how the information presented during the trials in Chicago of member of Guerreros Unidos, the cartel related to the disappearance of the 43 students in Iguala, was fundamental not only to bring some truth, but actually helped to build cases in Mexico against the perpetrators. Moreover, the Colombian case helped us portray how local institutions of transnational justice can articulate their work with U.S. trials in favor of truth, benefiting victims who demand the opportunity to know what was mentioned during the hearing and who can contribute to clarification of their cases. This is a case of Salvatore Mancuso, senior paramilitary leader and one of Colombia's most notorious drug traffickers, who, while in prison, revealed key information within local transitional justice mechanisms that contributed to local processes on the matter. Unfortunately, we found these examples to be the exception and not the rule within U.S. criminal procedures against members of organized crime. Discretion and political demands are the center, not victims' rights. Also, we've identified that plea agreements and benefits negotiated for testifying and providing information related to other cases contribute to the impunity of grave human rights violations. This is the case, for example, of Damaso López Serrano, El Minilic, member of the, of the Sinaloa cartel, son of Damaso López Núñez, one of El Chapo's closest allies, indicted for drug trafficking and other related crimes. At the time, he was also accused in Mexico for the assassination of Javier Valdez, a high-profile journalist who reported on the links between government officials and organized crime. In spite Mexico's extradition request to come back and be held responsible for his crimes, El Minilic was released a year ago after the judge considered he had paid his debt to society by offering information that even put him in danger. As he remains a key witness against Los Chapitos, Damaso stayed in the U.S. with government protection. No extradition to Mexico was granted. Javier's family was displayed and still awaits justice, one that will probably never come. What I've briefly exposed sheds some hints that can be used to achieve justice and build the memories of the consequences brought by violence. As the Truth Commission in Colombia stated, in the panorama of human rights and in a perspective of judicial independence, the dilemma of extradition should be reviewed in one specific aspect, the importance of investigating and providing the truth to the victims before any other considerations. 
big teams, collectives and organizations have been working to advocate for our countries to prioritize local investigation, prosecution and punishment when deciding on requests for extraditions of indicted persons who can contribute to clarifying criminal phenomena, human rights violations and large scale corruption in order to guarantee the satisfaction of victims' rights. In this context, it is vital that U.S. cooperation with Latin American countries take into consideration victims' demands. We invite the U.S. Congress to help us raise awareness on the dynamics and discretionary decisions within the U.S. justice system that contribute to weakening ours and hinder the path for truth and justice for hundreds of thousands of victims who, with whom we stand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Sergio de la Pena, welcome. Make sure your mic's on, yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, Chairman. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Sergio de la Peña, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Western Hemisphere, Hemisphere Affairs. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. In the last three years, the security of our country has deteriorated significantly, driven by two key factors. Massive illegal immigration flows to the United States and a significant shift in our neighbor's alignment from capitalism to socialism. Customs and Border Protection whose mission is to safeguard our borders, has been overwhelmed by unprecedented numbers of illegal immigrants. For the South, the people of Bolivia, Peru, Chile, Honduras, Colombia, and Brazil have elected leaders who espouse socialist governance models that move alignment in the direction of China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Mexico is also leaning toward greater state control of their respective economies, embracing the dialogue with authoritarian regimes in Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Bolivia, the biggest violators of human rights in the hemisphere. According to the Department of Homeland Security, there have been 1.72 million border crossings in fiscal year 21, 2.76 million in FY22, 2.5 million in FY23. Additionally, in FY21, an estimated 389,000 gotaways, individuals that the CBP was unable to detain, 500,000 in FY22, 600,000 in FY23 entered the United States, totaling 8.6 million illegal immigrants. The unprecedented number of immigrants is straining state and local economies, the impact most severe among U.S. persons in poor minority communities who must compete for federal and state funds uh, with illegal immigrants. The immigration flows are lucrative for transnational criminal organizations, also known as TCOs, who change who charge individuals thousands of dollars to traffic illegal immigrants to the United States. Many cannot pay up front. Desperate to come, they agree to interest-bearing contracts leaving illegal immigrants in a state of indentured servitude or modern-day slavery. Some women end up entangled in prostitution, drug trafficking against their, and against their will. Sexual abuse en route from country of origin to the United States is common. TCO's networks are extensive, reaching all continents. Some TCO's have expanded portfolios trafficking drugs and ever-growing number of contraband items that regenerate revenues. As the immigrant flows increase, TCO's earnings have grown from tens of millions to billions of dollars, adding to their ability to continue to expansion. The two biggest cartels, uh, the, the Sinaloa cartel and Jalisco Nueva Generacion, each generate equivalent earnings as a state uh, as the Mexican state of Nuevo Leon, which is the industrial heart of Mexico, and the third wealthiest of 32. As the U.S. government has become involved in transporting, housing, and feeding of illegal immigrants at times through U.S. subsidies of U.S. NGOs, TCOs have further increased their earnings, given, the <clears throat> given that they save money on the cost to the U.S. government, uh, which is currently subsidizing. The U.S. government has inserted us our taxpayer dollars into human trafficking chains that facilitates TCO's work making USG uh, the coyote, that's the human trafficker of choice. Increased TCO earnings have made them larger and stronger, thus emboldening them to challenge state authorities, fueling corruption of officials at all levels of government, and thus increasing TCO's abilities to violate human rights in the countries in which they operate. The open border provides easy access for terrorists entering the United States, increased potential for another terrorist, increasing potential for another terrorist attack. Customs and Border Protection have seen increasing numbers of individuals from the terrorist watch list from zero in FY19, three in FY20, 15 in FY21, 98 in FY22, 
and up to 169 uh, in FY23. Complicating the threat or gotaways, uh, these are individuals uh, that include unknown numbers of terrorists and criminals. Ranchers and property owners along the border have videotaped and observed gotaways dressed in camouflage entering at night. The, 20, uh, the, the 19, uh, the 9 11 terrorists that illegal, uh, th were illegal immigrants that overstayed their visas. It is highly likely that the next terrorist attack on the United States being planned by cells that entered through our southern border. In addition, terrorists, political agitators, intelligence operatives are likely operating in our southern border. The Cuban, Venezuelan, and Nicaraguan and Bolivian governments have vociferously denounced capitalism and espoused their Marxist socialist ideology with the implicit goal of replacing the U.S. as a preeminent power in the world. Capable bilingual operatives can easily blend in with like-minded organizations in the U.S. that espouse Marxist and other anti-U.S. ideologies. In addition to pursuing political infiltration, Venezuela has as a state policy the weakening of the United States by increasing illegal drug flows. Recently, Venezuela is threatening to attack Guyana, generating the potential for human rights abuses. In addition to plant-based drugs, fentanyl is on the rise in the United States. China produces ingredients for fentanyl and opioid products. Mexico imports the Chinese ingredients and manufactures the finished product. Production for the cost of a a kilo of fentanyl is roughly $200 compared with cocaine at $2,200 or $2,200 per kilo and heroin at $6,000 per kilo, with street prices varying significantly. Chinese and Mexican TCOs then distribute fentanyl into the United States, uh, which is 50 times more potent and significantly cheaper than heroin. Thus, it is often mixed with heroin and cocaine, making these products more addictive and affordable. The result has been an increasing in overdose deaths in 2022, the record-breaking 108,000 overdose deaths of roughly 770,000 from fentanyl. Contributing to fentanyl, another drug entering the United States, uh, is the overtasking of CBP agents who must contend with, the, with processing asylum and refugee seekers while patrolling the border suffers, thus giving TCOs freer reign to smuggle more drugs, make more money, and become stronger. Also, common criminals of all types are among the illegal immigrants entering the United States. As of February 4th, 2023, 16% of U.S. federal prison population consisted of illegal immigrants and individuals with little regard for private property. An acquaintance from Del Rio, Texas, shared with me that illegal immigrants broke into her freezer, stole 400 pounds of beef, they unplugged the freezer before departing, ruining an additional 600 pounds that they did not take. She and her family moved back from the ranch house, and now are fully armed wherever they go. Break-ins and, and trespassing are common occurrences along the border, uh, with, along with high-speed chases, where human traffickers attempt to evade law enforcement, with some resulting in deaths. Among the many victims are illegal immigrants who suffer the brunt of the cartels who abuse their human rights. The threat to U.S. national security and public safety from terrorists, TCOs, and common criminals is exacerbated by the alignment of our most populous Latin American hemispheric neighbors with socialist ideologies, meaning less cooperation with the U.S. government on issues of common interest that include investigating human rights abuses. In the last, two, in the last three years, Bolivia, Peru, Chile, Honduras, Colombia, and Brazil have elected socialist presidents in an unprecedented swing to the left. Recently elected pro-socialist presidents will place fewer restrictions on China, Russia, and Iran, and North Korea than their predecessors to operate in their respective countries, giving U.S. adversaries a platform to spy on U.S., Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Bolivia will be criticized less for their respective authoritarian governments and will be actively working with our adversaries to challenge the U.S. politically and militarily. Accordingly, uh, according to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, Russia provided Venezuela 20 billions in loans for military hardware in 2000. They provided tanks, armored personnel carriers to Nicaragua, and continued to engage with, the Cuba, with Cuba militarily. 
though these three countries have few resources to repay their Russian creditors, yet Russia continues to maintain close ties with Cuba to show the U.S. that they are still able to wield influence in Latin America. With socialist presence, the Russians will move, will have an open door and, the, and have less scrutiny uh, against on human rights abuses uh, that, and will be less um, that we have seen in Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. Human rights will suffer. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you all for your, for your testimony. And, um, and I, none, I don't think any of us up here want to see Russia expand its influence. That's why we're trying to fight to get uh, aid to Ukraine, which for whatever reason is being held up by some of my Republican colleagues right now, which is really frustrating. Um, and Vladimir Putin is, uh, is crowing about it right now. And I've been focused on uh, Latin America for many, many years. I, I, I was an aide to a congressperson 100 years ago, uh, it seems like. Um, and at that time, there was a, a, a huge migration from El Salvador in particular because of the violence from the Civil War that was going on. The government wasn't a left-wing government. We were supporting a, a pretty conservative government at the time, but the people were fleeing violence. And I, I speak, I've met with many of the uh, migrants who, have been, who are in Massachusetts right now um, from all over of the world, and the one of the the number one issue that I hear uh, from them as to why they left uh, was either uh, economic uh, challenges because there's, they they can't put food on the table in their home country, or they're fleeing criminal gangs, they're fleeing violence, they're afraid for their kids, um, and um, you know many of the issues that have been raised here today. Um, you know, weak justice systems, high levels of impunity, uh, lack of effective and competent civilian state presence. You know, I mean, they've been recognized for a long time. These aren't new, right? We've been talking, I go back to the 1980s, we were talking about s some of this stuff. Um, the U.S. government has invested resources uh, in response to these problems. You know, why has so little progress been made? I mean, what, what, what's missing? Uh, you know, what are the first steps that you would take if you were designing responses to these problems, uh, these basically internal problems um, in these countries? And I'll open this up to, uh, yeah, it's hard. So it, the it, people who are on um, on camera, just if you want to be recognized, you, I think you're just going to have to say, I want to be recognized because <laughs> I can't see you here. But Adam, and then we go to Sergio. Yeah. Yes. Adam. I mean, you're just talking about this this lack of state presence, this right. constant impunity. Uh, Colombia is ruling. The people who've run Colombia know this. Um, since the 1980s, they've come up with these programs, program after program, that's going to consolidate state presence and introduce the government into areas that don't have government. They tend to fall apart because maybe they threaten some very powerful interests, like those of organized crime that are embedded, because they move too slow and people don't see the benefit, sometimes because they depend too heavily on the military and don't bring in the rest of the government, very often because they just, one president attaches their name to it and the next president is not interested in carrying it on, um, because uh, there's fewer voters in rural areas where a lot of these things happen. It's this whole welter of reasons why there's this lack of political will. The big concern for me is the latest of those programs was the 2016 Peace Accord. The whole first chapter, 85% of the cost of implementing it was this effort to bring the state to all of these areas. And as actually Juanita, when she was a member of Congress, had led a team that put out an amazing 500-page report talking about, just a year ago, talking about how far behind this effort is falling. And that's a real concern. I think if you take a look at the power that the cartels have, have been able to amass, that's really at the heart of it. If you just look at what happened last week in, in Tex Texcatlitlan, which is within the state of Mexico, which is probably about less than 200 miles away from Mexico City, there was a narco chief that came in and demanded that the people pay certain taxes for just producing the few crops that they have. And he took the leader of the community, shot him in the head, and then the community went uh, in protest and took him and, and 10 of his other buddies out uh, in, a, in a melee that I've, I'm sure you've seen in videos. Now, those people are scared. The cartels have said they're gonna go after every person that went after them. The military is there, but they don't have the ability to go after these people. 
or they don't have the political support from AMLO to be able to do that. So part of the problem has been the power that these people have amassed. You can see these convoys that Jalisco Nueva Generación puts together for, for a show of force so that people are afraid to go against them. And they're gonna to continue to get more powerful because as we've seen with the flows of traffic coming into the United States, you've got more people coming in and that's distracting the CBP from being able to conduct its mission to avoid drugs coming into the United States and you see it in the deaths of Americans. Anybody else? If, if I could intervene. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, briefly, on the on the issue of, of migration and the issue of El Salvador, just uh, important to recognize that the, although we've seen between 2021 and 2023 a slight um, reduction in the amount of people from El Salvador uh, getting to the U.S. border, what we do know coming from the comparison to Venezuela is that when you have that level of democratic backsliding that we have been seeing in El Salvador through packing the uh, Supreme Court, uh, replacing the attorney general, reinterpreting the constitution to be able to run for re-election, although the constitution expressly forbids that, that is exactly the backsliding of, of democracy that has caused the level of, of Venezuelan migration. And just briefly on the issue of, of what is it that we haven't done coming from Colombia it, what we've seen has been in the past significant U.S. support in the fight against drugs, very much localized judicially at a national level in Bogota. Today, those municipalities that Adam was referring to, called the municipios pedet, those areas most affected by conflict and by poverty, still don't have forensic capacity to invest in social defenders. So going from a national discourse of fight against drugs and, and in, uh, increasing judicial capacity at that level to very uh, at a very granular and local level is definitely what's missing in the case of, of Colombia. If I could add yeah, a following up on, on, on what Juanita was saying, I think we need to understand that there's no, in, in Latin America, it's very hard to find consistent policies from one government to the, to the next. Governments and politicians are typically just looking for short-term political gains, and we're constantly in elections. Uh, so how can you make a policy that's sustainable and interesting for a politician to keep up with, uh, that is going to take more time and be less sexy than the Bukele model uh, throughout the different governments? to be sustainable and effective in the medium and long term. I think that's a key problem. And and I think you need to look not only at the national level, but try to find policies that have been effective at the sub-national level, where people feel closer to the people that govern them and governments feel more accountable to people in their constituencies. So, And when you look at those examples of policies that maybe were successful in the short term, that were implemented within the boundaries of the rule of law and have limited uh, insecurity rates, you see that they are just not sustainable because, and they don't get the visibility that they have uh, gotten other policies like the Bukele model. So if you think of Bukele, of course, he, as Juanito was saying, he got to power, he took over democratic institutions, and that enabled him to implement the state of emergency. But how sustainable is that in the medium and long term? And does he really care? Because what he will have today is enormous support to gain the, to win the elections next year. And, and it's a totally different conversation in terms of how this conversation happens within the country. And the success of a model like that one is closely linked to his investment on strategic communications that has enabled him to be extremely popular within the country and beyond its frontiers. So when you think about you know, how to combat this, it's very hard to find a champion of a model that combines strategic prosecutions, uh, punitive measures with due process, together with these sustainable, medium, long-term social policies that will address the root causes of violence. And I think that's what we should aim for, trying to identify experiences at the subnational level that we can draw from to understand you know, how that model is possible and replicable elsewhere. Otherwise, we're going to get stuck in this electoral and political cycle that is very short-sighted 
And that has made it very difficult for the region to leave uh, any decisive results that we can grab. And that just fuels the breeding ground for organized crime to foster. And with weak judiciary, uh, you only have impunity that just makes it Mm-hmm. more of a vicious cycle. But, but are, are there other are examples of, of local initiatives that you'd like to highlight here? I mean that I mean I, 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 I guess what I what I want to I mean to solve the challenges that we're talking about, it's more than about border security at the US border. I mean that, that, I mean that we can keep people out, we can find ways to keep people out, but that doesn't, that doesn't solve the problem of gangs and crime and death and destruction within these individual countries. But are there local initiatives that are, um, you know, that uh, that are worth highlighting here? That uh, maybe this is this is the way we should go. Congressman, thank you for that opportunity. So, in 2016, I was part of a training team in Mexico City to go from an inquisitorial to an accusatorial system. The system was the the process was working. Mexico was completely transitioning over in 2016, that transition occurred. The problem is that you still have a lot of guys with big guns that are confronting law enforcement agencies. For example, there was a a police officer in northern Mexico in, in, in a town near Monterrey that said, hey, I wanna help. He came out with his 38 pistol. The bad guys had M16s. So there's a significant difference in firepower that you have there, and then they, there were a lot more of them than, than there were of him. So the, these are the problems that you have. You've got to take the guns away from the bad guys that are so well equipped, and they keep getting more and more wealthy by the money that's being made through human trafficking and all these other activities that we've talked about. So the root cause is you've got to take the guns away from the bad guys. One other example in Colombia, if you look at the FARC fronts, that were responsible for producing, for producing the drugs, when they had the peace process, those FARC fronts are still the same. They never, they never turned their, their badge in and came in from the cold. They stayed out there because that's their money-making proposition, and that's why you've continued to see the production of drugs in those areas that the, the new FARC controls. Yeah. No, I... Um, Can I jump in here? Oh. Wait, go ahead. Sorry. Could I jump in on, Absolutely. on the, both of these questions? trying to be very brief. In terms of what's missing in responses to organized crime in Mexico and and U.S. cooperation, uh, in Mexico, I would say that from the U.S. side and really universally in what we've heard today on the panel, there's consensus that the levels of power and violence uh, with which organized crime operates stem not just from firepower, rather from relationships of tolerance and, and collusion and the climate of impunity in Mexico. And actions to address those areas have been ongoing in cooperation. But the question is, what are the priorities, for instance, that the U.S. is communicating to Mexico in the bilateral security and rule of law relationship? And we see, as has been mentioned, an enormous emphasis on uh, certain types of drug interdiction, an emphasis on obtaining Mexico's cooperation in purported border control policies, and a lack of that same level of priority politically uh, being placed on these more medium-term institution building, capacity building solutions, anti-corruption efforts, when those are actually the areas that are needed to solve this problem. So one very concrete example uh, that I mentioned in my written testimony is focusing on internal and external controls for security and justice institutions. Uh, We need to have that focus on strengthening institutional accountability. That's the only way to sustainably uh, improve investigations and reduce uh, violence and prioritize patterns of violence that are affecting the population and not just movements um, of different illicit uh, economies. Now, in terms of specifically what's missing to weaken organized crimes control over uh, migrant flows, Uh, Well, what's missing is what the countries of the region have pledged to build, which are lawful, orderly, safe paths for those who are displaced. A huge percentage of those, as mentioned here, have been displaced by violence. I just came back from the border last week and heard stories similar to those that we always hear along the migration route of families who had to flee, who were under threat. Uh, Currently, they come. Where I was specifically last week was down at at Nogales, southern Arizona. Um, And currently, families come 
to the port of entry. They've been trying for months to get an appointment to ask for asylum. They can't get an appointment. They end up waiting for months in a physical line outside the port of entry, trying to do things the right way. But when those families can't survive in Mexico anymore and can't do things the right way, they have to turn to human smugglers and pay organized criminal groups. They're driven to cross in remote areas through these irregular means. So to the extent that there are not available lawful paths for people to flee in these organized criminal groups to seek protection, and to the extent that people are also, and especially in past policies, for instance, like Title 42, people are expelled back into Mexico, uh, that puts them directly in the hands of organized crime and enriches those, those criminal groups, as has been demonstrated. Um, and finally, good examples, or you know, what, are, what are some local examples? The same Ayotzinapa case that we've mentioned here, it has, it, it has both the extremes of good and bad practices within it, but it's a case where there has been a period of uh, an in the fairly independent investigation that has been able to uncover a lot of the truth of what happened in this enforced disappearance case, uncover these networks of state and non-state collusion, these packs of impunity, uncover how investigators use torture to manufacture a false version of events, and it has generated a lot of uh, indictments and advances that haven't been seen in other cases in Mexico. And why was that? It was because there were independent uh, investigators, uh, international experts actually allowed to participate in the case. It was because international bodies and human rights organizations uh, were participating. It was because there was actually a trustworthy, committed special prosecutor appointed who since was uh, forced out. And so this shows it is possible to build these investigations and uncover these networks. Uh, it's a matter of political will, and it's a matter of having those controls in the institutions uh, to prevent these packs of collusion and impunity. Yeah. Well, political will is, is is at the heart of all of this, and it's uh, and it's and it, it's easier. We always say we we need the political will. You know, you talk about taking guns away from the bad guys. We don't even have the political will to take guns away from bad guys in our own country. Never mind in other countries, right? And um, and these institutions that we d want to work. Oftentimes, they are compromised because the people who are in these institutions have been bought off, are corrupt. We've seen that in Colombia. We've seen that in El Salvador. We've seen it all over the place where, you know, the, the system, the judicial system isn't working, and we find out sometime later because somebody was on the take. Um, and, and, you know, and, and uh, so you're trying to find... I mean, look, look what's happening in Guatemala right now. I mean, I, it, I mean, we talk about institutions um, n not living up to what they're supposed to. I mean, they may nullify an election. Um, and, um, you know, and God only knows what the chaos would be if they succeed in doing that. I mean, uh, and so whether it's a right-wing government, a left-wing government, a moderate government, I mean, people to get to decide who, who should you know, who, who, who should run their countries. And if they don't like them, they can get rid of them uh, in the next election. Uh, but in the meantime, I mean, uh, you, know, you know, again, talking to the people who are coming here, so much of what you hear is about the fear for their safety. Uh, and because of the internal challenges, um, you know, that exist in the country that they're fleeing from. That was a call for votes, but I, I want to give everybody a chance to kind of say, one last thing for the record, and we may follow up with questions, but I, uh, for votes, uh, don't even ask me to explain <laughs> why we vote when we vote here. But anyway, we're, they just, they call for a vote. But why don't we go down to Adam, one, any last? Sure, just, I'll, maybe I'll end with a good example. Okay. Uh, at the end of October, I was in the town of La Hormiga in Putumayo, which is right near the, <clears throat> in southern Colombia, near the Ecuador border, one of the main coca growing municipalities in the country. Um, about 20 m m minutes drive from the town center, there was a village um, that had no coca and hasn't had coca since the end of the 2000s because led by women largely, um, civil society there cooperated with a few civic-minded mayors, mayors in a whole county that has only 20 police, and managed to organize alternative crops, a soccer league that is now competes nationally and many other instances. And that just shows that you know even when everything's not working, there's always civil society, and that's why we're protecting their human rights is so important. Sergio? I think at the heart of all this, you have to look at the, the money that's being generated by all these illicit activities, and this is the challenge that we're gonna face. 
I've been to Colombia. I've flown over that same area, and I noticed that there was a coca field that was sitting right in right in front of this this uh, the this small family's uh, dwelling. And if you look at the road networks, it's right next to a palm uh, plantation that p produces palm oil. The road to town was probably 15 kilometers. So even though they had the opportunity to grow alternative crops, they preferred the coca. And they preferred the coca because that generates more money. The more money generates more corrupt and illicit activities, and it strengthens the bad guys that have the guns. And this is the reason that we have that problem. And then you've got governments like Mr. AMLO that's talking about hugs and not bullets. You're not going to be able to put the pressure on the governments to really make a change. A few years ago, when I was in Columbia, we, I saw a coca field within a, 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 a stone's throw from a military installation. Um, so, you know, um, uh, um, Stephanie. I'll just end with one thought. For obvious reasons, um, I've spoken a lot about U.S. policy, U.S. Uh, cooperation. But I did want to highlight that, of course, the people who day to day are seeking, struggling, and working to build security and the rule of law in Mexico, who are documenting human rights violations, who are representing victims of crimes and victims of human rights violations, are Mexican uh, civil society organizations, collectives of family members, human rights defenders, journalists, family members of the disappeared who are out day after day physically searching for their loved ones. And it's also so important uh, to hear their voices, to take their recommendations into account in uh, different actions on, on both sides of the border and in cooperation, and to advocate for protection for those populations who face high risks in Mexico of being physically attacked, unfortunately, of losing their lives, of, of being uh, censored, of being spied on, as, as we've already mentioned. So I just wanted to end by recalling the central place that those actors should have in all of these actions. And, and this commission, one of the things that we you know, want to do is, is work with those people and, and, and offer them a voice or advocate on behalf of them when they're under threat, um, because we agree with you that they're so incredibly important to this. Renata. Thank you. I, I guess I just want to call to take a victim center approach to whatever is missing or maybe to, to all that is missing on the human rights approach and on the way the U.S. has invested resources uh, to advocate for change in, in countries like Mexico. I mean, um, academia, we need to understand who are the victims of um, of the organized crime and also state actors that inflict violence. Academia in Mexico ha uh, talk about, for example, of disposable population. Victims often are crossed by gender and uh, class, for example, that are also closely intertwined with lack of access to basic needs such as food, water, education, infrastructure. So I think um, the call for a victim center approach to understand who are the most affected by Thank by these you. violent actions. Thank you. Tamara. Thank you. Um, I would conclude just saying that we need to show that we can deliver security within the boundaries of the rule of law. And there are examples, and we can provide more information in writing, but there are examples in the Diadema Municipality in Brazil, the Minas Gerais, even in Guatemala, when you look at the combination of factors when CC, the International Commission for Investigation, right. was uh, working together with a program that extended school hours for kids helped lower rates in the country. And these examples are very important. I will conclude. I was asked to talk about the roads were linked to the private sector in this presentation. I think this generates a positive climate for investment. And that is very important because it generates a licit job market that will, in essence, allow people to have the opportunity to work elsewhere and not within the organized crime organizations or networks that are attempting in certain contexts in Latin America. Thank, Thank you. you. Juanita. Thank you. I also wanted to first highlight a, a positive example. Tamara was speaking about Guatemala and the role of CICIG. During, between 2006 and 2019, 
Guatemala was capable of reducing its homicide rate from 44 per 100,000 people to 25.6. And it was Claudia Paz y Paz at the head of the ordinary prosecutor office at the same time that CICIC was working, but leading from the prosecutor office with integrity, as opposed to what we're seeing today, sadly, a, the creation of forensic capacity to dismantle organized crime. We have, and even after everything that's happening in Guatemala, their homicide rate has not started to uh, rise again because of that strength of, of actual forensic capacity and strategic investigation. And just briefly on the case of El Salvador, I, I just have to raise that we are very concerned uh, about the shift of the U.S. government uh, foreign policy towards El Salvador. We understand that having an engagement diplomatically is important, but not if it's to sacrifice human rights. Uh, that Brian Nichols was there on the day of the announcement of the re-election of Bukele and calling uh, a very strategic ally um, is concerning uh, and it really uh, deteriorates the possibility of civil society groups fighting in El Salvador to defend human rights to do so. So that the path should be to support in the med independent media outlets and other civil society groups that are fighting for human rights in El Salvador. Thank you. Most, most of the journalists that I've worked with in El Salvador over the years who have done some really great work are now out of the country because they, could, they, they feel they can no longer safely operate in the country. But anyway, I, I, I apologize for the that we, we are abruptly ending this. Somebody called for a motion to adjourn. I have no idea what, why, uh, but in any event, I have, to, I have to go vote. But I appreciate, uh, I think this is an important topic, and I'm not even quite sure, like, what are the, the I, I, you've given us some good ideas here today, but I mean, we, that we, we often don't talk about this, about, you know, criminal gangs and, and, and crime in general, in the context of human rights, um, and uh, and I think it's important because it is it is generating, you know, a great deal of the migration that we're seeing here, uh, but it's also creating insecurity in countries where people's security, quite frankly, uh, needs to be guaranteed, and people are dying, uh, people and you know parents are afraid for their lives of their children. So, so I appreciate uh, this, and we will we will stay in touch, and it's great to see everybody in person and virtually. Uh, and um, and so I have to go vote on this important motion to adjourn. I don't know. Anyway, but anyway, I wish everybody happy holidays, and thank you so much. The hearing is adjourned.